mixing bowls, there are six main ingredients that go into making dough. Flour, water, salt, sugar, yeast, and oil. And then there's our special goodie bag that makes Domino's Pizza Dough, Domino's Pizza Dough. And that's how you get to be one of the largest pizza manufacturers in the world, not just the United States. But anyway, so that draws us into our next chapter, chapter number 16. This is Chef Hawks back here with you again on our Pro Star adventure. So now we're looking at sandwiches and pizza this week. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at sandwiches first of all. So we have different combinations of flavors and textures. Uh, using different breads, different condiments, and meats and vegetables in most of our sandwiches. We categorize them two separate ways, hot and cold, really simple. Let's take a look. So when we're looking at cold sandwiches, so we generally will have two slices of bread, or it may be a, a bread roll that you cut in half, and then you're going to have some kind of a spread. That could be butter, could be mayonnaise, anything along those lines. And then you're going to have your filling. The main, uh, the main part of that sandwich, uh, we generally would use meats and cheeses. Um, it may be a type of salad, a bound salad, like an egg salad or tuna salad. So we've got different types of cold sandwiches. Uh, so we have submarine sandwiches. You can see the uh, picture over on the right hand over here. Um, so uh, these are generally cold. They're long and and they're they're sliced from that roll. Uh, you may get. Uh, like Subway has, they're foot long, or you may have a shorter one of those, um, and it may be that it's cut from one of those long submarines, or it may be an individual submarine. Um, you generally would have one or more of the following types of uh, fillings, so cheeses, meats, lettuce, tomato, onions, and then all sorts of other uh, additional pieces that can be in there. They're also known as subs, grinders, heroes, and hoagies. Uh, depending on where you are in the country or around the world, they can have different names to them. Um, and then just a good example of a hot filling uh, for, a, uh, for a submarine sandwich is a meatball sub. Then we move on to wraps. So wraps can sometimes be considered to be a more healthy uh, option just because there's less bread and more filling to these ones. But I guess it would depend upon what the filling is as to how healthy it might be. Um, but so these are a, a flatbread kind of product. So that can include tortillas, pizza breads, uh, cracker breads, and rice paper uh, wrappers as well. Um, and so generally, again, you would have some kind of a spread that would be in there. You can have hot and cold fillings in them, uh, and they will either be rolled up or they'll be like the pockets with the pieces uh, that you see on the picture right here. 
Then we move on to a multi-decker sandwich. Multi-decker, what is that? So as you can see in the picture right over here, this is actually a club sandwich. Uh, we're going to take a little uh, look and uh, and how we make one of these. But you see, it has one, two, three slices of bread. When you make a uh, a club sandwich, which is a multi-decker sandwich, because it has multi-decks of bread. Um, so that basically means if you have more than two slices of bread. So can you name a famous multi-decker sandwich? Well, how about a Big Mac? Right, we may not think about that as being a multi-decker sandwich, but technically a Big Mac is because it has the top and the bottom layers of the bun, and then it has that center layer of bread in there as well. It's a multi-decker sandwich. So we can have lots of different ingredients that can go into these kinds of things, but a club sandwich traditionally would have three slices of toasted bread, mayonnaise, uh, chicken or turkey, and ham, uh, bacon, cheese, lettuce, tomato, and then they're cut into triangles, uh, like you see in the picture here, normally held down with some, uh, with some uh, skewers just to hold them all in place. Now we move on to open face sandwiches. So this is where you have one slice of bread instead of the two, and uh, you would have the filling or the topping uh, going straight on top and fully on display. Uh, so as you can see over on the right hand side on this picture, you can actually see a great example um, of some uh, of, of some canapes, which a canapé is a small open face sandwich. 
and uh, these uh, these are actually used um, as hors d'oeuvres that can be hand passed around in a, a fancy private party. But as you can see, the actual filling um, is the main part that's on show, and you'd have a small piece of garnish that would be on there as well. And they could be hot or cold, uh, just served as little bite-sized finger food. So let, let's look at a few other examples of some uh, of some canapes as well. And so we've got some really pretty ones here because you can really do an awful lot with this. So you can use bread or toast that can be cut out into different shapes. English muffins, crackers, Melba toast, which is very thinly sliced toast that's, uh, that's very, very dried out on, um, uh, and toasted before it's used, chilled and then used. Um, you can use tiny little unsweetened pastry shells as well. And so on each of these, it would feature some kind of a spread, maybe a flavoured butter, cream cheese, uh, meat or fish uh, with zesty flavour to it. Um, and then the base, uh, there are alternatives that you can use uh, that can be fruit, vegetables or meat as well. And then we move on to tea sandwiches. So what's a tea sandwich? This is when you go out for afternoon tea, a very traditional thing in Britain, um, something that's popular. Uh, all over the world, though, it's something to uh, something small to eat in the afternoon um, while you're drinking some nice hot tea. And so these sandwiches are dainty. These are small little sandwiches, as you can see, just little finger sandwiches with all the crusts cut off them. So they're very refined um, and they can be cut into different shapes, circles or squares as well. Um, and it's the same kind of fillings that we were put into canapes because they should be small and dainty. They can also be open faced as well. So let's talk about open face sandwiches. So this is where a whole different world kind of opens up. As you can see in the picture right over here, we have a full on sandwich filling right here, but we're just not going to place a, uh, a topping of another piece of bread up on top. So these can be hot or cold sandwiches, and we're just going with just the top part of it. Um, and so this would have you know, sauce or cheese or something like that that can be broiled and it can be melted over the top quickly. Um, so that it really brings together all of the food that's on there as well. Um, and again, you can serve these in smaller variations uh, to have as a small hors d'oeuvre. So then we can also have some other hot sandwiches. So this can be grilled or toasted sandwiches with the filling in between two slices of bread um, or inside a, a bun of some sort. Um, and then you would butter it on the outside of the bread, browning it on a griddle or in the oven. And then we can also take it up another notch. If you look at the picture on the right, this is where we are putting it into a, into a panini press. And it actually compresses the sandwich at the same time as heating and toasting the outside. So it doesn't add additional fat to the sandwich, but it adds another whole dimension to it where it caramelizes and toasts up the outside of that bread and warms up all of the filling as well. Let's take a look at how these are done. I'm just getting ready to sit down for a grilled panini sandwich. I often make these whether I'm in the city or here at the cottage. They're super easy, but I think it's all about what you put in them. Just a reminder, if you don't have a panini maker, you could also do this on the stove top using a skillet. There's a great idea. Let me show you my favorite. I start with two pieces of stone mill bread. This is a, a wonderful three grain bread. It has oatmeal, whole wheat, and then flax seed. A uh, very beautiful. I spread butter on one slice, spread butter on the second slice, and then flip them over. Now we're ready to fill my favorite sandwich. I put a bit of Edam cheese down. Uh, Edam is a slightly sweet Dutch cheese. I then have thin slices of turkey. Now I put a piece of tomato, a little bit of salt and pepper, a big clump of alfalfa sprouts, very healthy, some sliced avocado. Look at how beautiful that is another piece of cheese, and then on the other piece of bread, I take a dollop of mayonnaise, a dollop of pesto, I kind of stir it together, and then I slather that piece of bread. Place it all together, you place it on your griddler, and in about five minutes, your panini is ready to go. I love this sandwich. Uh, it is so wonderful, especially when you're cooking it on a panini maker. Everything is so warm and beautiful. Then we move on to deep fried sandwiches. So this sandwich in particular, we're looking at a Monte Cristo, it actually applies in two separate categories. Not only is it a 
uh, a deep fried sandwich, but it's also a multi-decker sandwich. Uh, so with this one, uh, so this is where we would be dipping a sandwich into an egg batter. That helps to protect the actual sandwich so that when it's frying, it all kind of holds together um, and it doesn't all just break apart. Um, and uh, it helps to, it helps with even cooking as well. So this is where we can have it um, in a flat griddle as well to reduce the amount of fat, make it a little less greasy. But a Monte Cristo is traditionally made with turkey or chicken breast, ham and Swiss cheese. Let's take a look at this one. So we're taking our crusts off our bread, applying a little mayonnaise to each one. A little Gouda cheese, melts really well. Some ham, then we're layering them up. Remember it's a triple decker sandwich, as well as being a fried sandwich. Get your eggs and a little milk, a little salt. We always want to season everything up. Now it's going to go into the pan where we can sear it off. This is a sandwich that's been around for a long time, but stays popular. It's a great sandwich. How to make pizza. Pizza has three main components, crust, sauce, and toppings. To make a basic cheese pizza, start with making the dough for the crust. Lightly dust the prep table with flour. Stretch and even out the dough on the floured surface, rolling into a round shape. Drape the dough onto a floured pan or pizza peel. Next, ladle sauce evenly over the dough, leaving an inch margin around the edge for the crust. Sprinkle grated cheese evenly over the sauce and any additional toppings. Now, bake the pizza in a very hot oven, ideally 500 degrees Fahrenheit, 260 degrees Celsius for about 15 minutes or until the crust turns brown and bubbles. Finish the pizza by brushing the crust with oil or butter and season the pie with fresh herbs. Cut and serve hot. How to make pizza. Now we're moving on to pizza. So when we look at pizza, Really, we can actually look at this as a sandwich as well, because doesn't it kind of look familiar to one of those open-faced sandwiches where you have the bread on the bottom, then you have the spread that could be considered to be that tomato sauce, and then you have the toppings, which could be considered to be the filling of the sandwich. Kind of familiar, right? Well, that's why the pizza and sandwiches all kind of fit into that same category. So it's not unusual for us to call um, these a pie as well, and we'll talk a little more about that in a few minutes. But yes, it's a hot open-faced Italian pie. The base is generally made with a yeast dough, uh, which uh, we will be making those in class because uh, learning about yeast and the, the effects that yeast can have on food, uh, it's amazing what we can actually uh, produce. Lots more flavors and the effects of making a rising dough uh, using our yeast as well. And then we generally cook our pizzas in a few different ways. We can have uh, wood-fired ovens, roasting ovens, and kiln baking as well. Let's take a look at how some of these work.
fine oven is really just my favorite way of cooking. All the sights and sounds are much more intense when you're cooking because you feel much more connected to the food that you're working with, much more connected to the fire that you're using to cook the food. Just love the whole experience of it. It's a really uh, fun way of cooking. It's a very intuitive way of cooking. You think about uh, where you're placing the food, the kind of heat that you use in the oven. It's just a great experience. Welcome to Volrath University. I'm Chef Rich, and we're here in the Volrath Test Kitchen to discuss the features and benefits of the Volrath Digital Conveyor Pizza Oven. With this product, you can bake fresh dough, hard-baked pizzas, flatbreads, and calzones easily and consistently. They also have functionality to toast garlic bread, cheese bread, and sandwiches. By using forced convection baking, these ovens are able to provide uniform results across four independent thermostatically controlled heat zones, two on the top and two on the bottom of the unit. Each zone has three elements, so you can truly customize how you want an item cooked. By using the digital controls, you can easily customize the temperature and pass-through time or choose from one of six preset menus. The 18-inch belt in this unit fits pizzas up to 16 inches, and each end of the oven has an adjustable door that can be raised or lowered to accommodate for the size of the product you are working with. The adjustable heat shields allow food to pass into the oven and regulate how much heat will be retained at each end of the oven. With fast-reacting quartz heaters, standby mode saves up to 75% of your energy use during slow periods and allows it to quickly recover to full power. The stainless steel and aluminized construction of the ovens are used for high temperatures and corrosion resistance. These pizza ovens feature a maintenance-free drive system and there's no lubrication required. Okay, so we're still just working with half an oven here. And I'm reaching the maximum capacity for half an oven, which is really nine of these pies. The little space in between. But I've got more pies coming. So I'm going to go ahead and mirror what I was doing on this side, on the other side. Now you gotta, you gotta keep track of stuff and make sure you're not burning anything. Because things are gonna be moving fast. The finishing zone here next to this radiant flame moves really fast. So you do your spin. Now I'm going in next to this flame. And I'm going to bump it up. I'm going to bump it up because I see a line of pizzas coming at me. And as quickly as I move to that other side, I'm starting to move some pies out of this side. Every time I take a pizza out of that finishing zone, I'm moving that next row in. You always want to have pizzas sitting right next to the flame. Whether you have two pizzas in there or 18 pizzas in your oven, you're always going to have some next to the flame finishing off. Just keep crowding them in. Now I can hit that third, that row. Now I'm bumping up to a second row on the second side of the oven. So I'm going to take that flame up a little higher. So it's affecting those pizzas in the next row. As you can see, with those different cooking methods, all of them are hot. We generally will cook our pizza at a high temperature because we want that base to get a good sear to it. And we also want all of those ingredients on top to uh, start cooking through and for that cheese to get a nice brown on it as well. Um, but whether you're using that uh, wood-fired uh, oven, if you're using a deck oven, as we saw where he was literally playing Tetris, where he's moving all of those pizzas around to finish them off on all sides, um, that's a deck oven, and you can have multiple decks on a deck oven as well. Um, and, uh, and then being able to use that pizza oven that's the type of oven that you would find if you had a small little hole in the wall in New York City and you didn't have space for a massive oven. 
um, that Volrath oven would actually work really well because you can pass through um, a significant number of pizzas and um, and garlic bread and things like that through that machine um, in, within a fairly short period of time. You can cook a lot of things and it only takes up a much smaller space in there. So our pizza is all about having those uh, different flavors and seasoning, uh, season sauce um, on them and then the toppings which generally is involves cheese, meats and vegetables. Um, now with the crust you can have a thin, a thick or a pan pizza. Um, we'll get more into those as well in a couple of minutes. Then you can have different kinds of themed pies as well. All the big companies now have come out with all sorts of different imagination items uh, that, that they create just to keep pizza interesting. But the fact is, is there's a reason why there are so many pizza restaurants all across the United States and all around the world. So just in the United States alone, every second there are 350 slices of pizza sold. So that means about 21,000 slices every minute are sold in the United States. And so that can support a significant number of pizza restaurants. Uh, pizza can be a fairly profitable business to be in if you do it well and if you offer a good a good quality product people are happy to pay you um, significantly more than it costs to make a pizza so let's now look at the different styles of pizza that we have to choose from so chicago style pizza is one of the traditional types of pizza that we call a pizza pie and you can actually see in the picture here it's a very deep type of uh, deep type of uh, dish pizza where it's more about that sauce. You're going to have so many different levels of toppings and sauce, sometimes even having an extra layer of dough in between as well there, um, that just makes this whole thing into a very thick pie. Then we have New York style pizza. This is where you have a crisp and thin dough, um, and then normally a very large size um, that involves having a light tomato sauce with limited toppings that are spread out um, across acreage rather than piled up on top of each other like in uh, in the Chicago style pizza. Neapolitan style, so this is all about freshness. And so the, these are very basic uh, and, and uh, clear kind of flavors that you get on these. So you have a really nice pizza dough to start off with. And then rather than having a tomato sauce, you're going to have fresh tomatoes on there um, or, or a fresh sauce on there. Um, that's all emphasizing, uh, rather than it being cooked and processed, it's all emphasizing the freshness of the foods that are on there uh, with the cheese and maybe some fresh uh, basil on top of that. Back to talking about sandwiches. So it's really important when we're making sandwiches that we ensure their freshness. Um, so if, as long as we're covering them, wrapping them up, we can prepare them in advance um, up to two to three days um, for the uh, for the sandwiches that can be stored, but we do need to be careful. It's not necessarily going to be a bacteriological problem um, as as much as a freshness problem, especially with bread. Bread does not keep for a significant length of time um, when it's used. The bread is our main part of our sandwich, and so this is the edible container that holds the food inside. It provides bulk and nutrients as well. Uh, you have things like Pullman loaves, um, are very are the most popular. They're the white bread uh, sliced loaves that you can see on the right hand side here. But it's all about freshness and those loaves will not keep for a length of time. Then we move on to our spreads that go into our sandwiches. Um, so this is something that prevents the bread from soaking up the filling. So if we're going to make a tomato uh, sandwich or have a sandwich that has tomatoes in it or cucumbers in it, anything with high water content, we want to insulate the bread from that. So if we're spreading something like butter or mayonnaise um, uh, on, onto the bread, it's going to help to insulate that water content away from, the, uh, from, from those high water content foods. Um, so butter, yeah, you want to make sure it's soft enough to be able to spread. You can whip it in a mixer. You can add different flavors. You can add some different herbs and spices to it to, to actually add in additional uh, flavorings to it. But these spreads offer flavor and moisture to the bread. Just be careful with our mayonnaise because that can not only add flavor, but it can make bread a little soggy after a while as well. Then we're on to our main attraction, the filling. So this is what's going to give us our primary flavor. 
So this is going to be the protein or vegetables or both. And these can be sliced or grilled meats and cheeses, salad mixtures, um, that can all be sliced, ground, blended, or tossed. Then we move on to our accompaniments that go with um, our different main fillings that work with them symbiotically. So we want to have maybe some different condiments like ketchup, mustard, and horseradish sauce, uh, possibly some lettuce, tomatoes, and onions if we're looking to have some fresh and pickled vegetables, uh, maybe some uh, sweet or dill pickles. Um, and then we have some other accompaniments that go next to the sandwich. Um, so this can be french fries or chips, be potato salad and different slaws, and it can also be things like fresh fruit as well. So let's look at our main sandwich fillings. Uh, so if we're looking at beef, this can be roast, roast beef slices, either hot or cold, hamburger patties, small steaks, uh, corned beef, pastrami, ground beef or sloppy joes, um, or we can have hot dogs. If we have mayonnaise based salads, remember the bound salads, uh, apart from the starchy ones, most of the others work well in the sandwich. So things like egg salad, tuna salad, chicken salad, turkey salad, crab meat salad, and ham salad. And then we can also add fish, so tuna, sardines, smoked salmon and lox, uh, shrimp, anchovies, and fried fish all work really well. And pork products, so we've got roast pork, ham, bacon, Canadian bacon, and liverwurst. And then we have poultry, turkey and chicken. And then of course cheeses, cheddar, Monterey Jack, mozzarella, pepper jack, provolone, American cheese, cream cheese, among others. And then moving on to our pickled vegetables, so dill and sweet pickles, olives, peppers, artichoke hearts, and then all the different condiments. Mustard, horseradish sauce, ketchup, hot sauce, relish, barbecue sauce. And our vegetables, so lettuce, tomatoes, onions, they can either be raw or grilled. Sprouts, could be alfalfa sprouts, bean sprouts, um, spinach and other greens, and then eggplant and different types of mushroom. Portobello mushrooms are very popular for, popular for this, great flavor um, and significant size as well that you can literally cover a sandwich with. Then we have some of our other types of fillings. So we've got peanut butter and other uh, nut butters like almond butter, and uh, different kinds of jellies, hard cooked eggs, fruits can be fresh or dry, and then we have some different dips that also work really well as going into either fillings or spreads for our sandwiches, like hummus and tabbouleh. So what are the most popular pizza toppings? So generally meat, poultry, and seafood. We've got things like pepperoni, sausage, bacon, chicken, anchovies, and shrimp. And then cheeses. So you're looking for really good cheeses that uh, you have to consider whether you want them to fully melt. So things like mozzarella, parmesan, or if you want them to kind of crumble and break up, uh, or somewhere in between. So things like ricotta, feta, gorgonzola, um, if you want a good blue cheese in there as well. And then you have vegetables like mushrooms, olives, tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, onions, broccoli, spinach, and arugula all work wonderfully well. Just consider them to make sure that you use them appropriately. Things like arugula may be something you add towards the end just to wilt on there, um, whereas if you have something like mushrooms, you may actually want to saute those before they even go into your pizza, all depending on what you want that final texture and flavor to be. So when we're designing our sandwich station, and you can see an example here of a sandwich station, how do we want to design that? So we want it to be that we can uh, reduce the number of hand motions that we have to make according to the most popular items we make on our menu. So if the most popular sandwich that we have on our menu is a ham and cheese sandwich, then having the cheese over here and having the ham all the way over here may not be the best use of our space. So you always want to look at what your available equipment and space is. Um, but the two, uh, two basic components of an efficient sandwich station are ingredients and equipment. So we may want to consider having the cheese and the ham maybe closer together if you serve a lot of those kinds of sandwiches. But it's all about setting up our mise en place. So that's where we're going to separate and clean lettuce leaves, slicing tomatoes, preparing our garnishes, slicing meats and cheeses in advance, mixing up different fillings, and preparing our spreads. 
We want to have it set up so we reduce our hand movements so we're as efficient as we can possibly be. So we may want to have uh, portioned up slices uh, or counts or weights of different products and different portion fillings. With our work table, we may want to have all our ingredients spread out appropriately for us. And the different types of storage facilities we want to consider too. You, you're going to want to have some refrigeration equipment for the cold ingredients, a steam table where you can store your hot ingredients hot and ready for use, and then dry storage uh, for different things like breads and dry goods, um, and then using different storage materials carefully as well. Things like plastic wrap, deli papers and labels. Uh, this is how we can keep our food fresh and have it noted so that we know that it's fresh. We have different hand tools when we're making different sandwiches and pizza. So we have things like a pizza peel. That was what you saw in the video with the deck oven where they were moving the pizzas around. Um, then you have things like spreaders, spatulas, serrated knives, chef's knives, cutting boards and meat slices to be able to prepare all of these different ingredients to make these sandwiches and pizzas. And then you want to have portion control equipment. This is really important for everything we do. Because for some products, it may be that we have a, a very low cost, and so it doesn't matter so much about how much we're using. But there are other ingredients that have a significant food cost and can dramatically uh, bring down your profits or make it, make it to where your uh, profits are zero or even in the minus numbers while we're making a loss. So this is where it comes into play where we may want to use portion scoops. So we have uh, the exact same amount that's portioned out each time or a portion scale, so we're actually measuring some products by weight. This is really important as well because when someone comes into your restaurant to eat something, if the first day they come in, they get a significantly large portion, and then the next time they come in, it's literally half the size, they may well complain about that. Well, I got a whole lot more last time. What's going on? Well, last time that chef was just finishing off what was in the container, and so you just happened to get more. Well, that's not going to fly with the customer. And if the expectation from the customer is that they get the same every time, then you need to make sure that it's appropriately portioned every single time. So then our cooking equipment for hot sandwiches, that's where we're using things like griddles, grills, broilers, uh, deep fryers, and microwave ovens. Then looking at our pizza preparation. So you generally want to have a separate prep area for all this. Um, you want to be able to have your ingredients evenly distributed across the top of that pizza and the sauce and the other ingredients as well. And you want to have those going to right around a half an inch uh, to the edge of that pizza. We normally leave that crust uh, without topping on it. Now we move on to our equipment that we use when we're producing pizza. So our ovens that we looked at, we have the conveyor oven, deck ovens, and wood-fired pizza kilns or ovens. Um, and then we also use our metal or wooden pizza peel. You can see over on the right, uh, the picture right here is the pizza peel. That's what we're using to move our pizzas around in our oven so that we can make sure that they're nice and evenly cooked and we can remove them from the oven very easily, even if we have a very deep oven. Uh, and then when we're cutting it, we're either using a rotary cutter or a pizza wheel, or we're using a curved pizza knife. This is a type of knife that has a curve to the blade, so we can literally go from one side of the pizza rolling it all the way to the other side. Whenever you take that pizza out of the oven, don't feel that you want to cut it instantly um, and, uh, and, and move it around too much. Literally let it rest for a short period of time. It allows the cheese and all the other toppings to set on top while they're not bubbling away. This will help your pizza to have a much better appearance uh, when you go to cut it as well. And you want to have good, quick, clean cuts. You don't want it to be where it's destroying the quality of the cheese on top. You want to be able to see all those toppings and the cheese on top. You always want to try and get good even slices as well, whether it's triangular or square slices. So let's look at our methods that we use to create canapes. So these are these small uh, one or two bite open sandwiches. So we're preparing our bases, the spreads and the garnishes. We're getting all of our mise en place together first, right? That's what we always do in culinary arts. We always want to use quality ingredients. These are just going to be small little morsels for people to enjoy, so you want it to be high quality. We're going to assemble these close to service time so that the, whether it's toast or crackers or pastry um, or bread, doesn't get stale or doesn't get soggy before it's, uh, before it's had time to be served. 
And so always following time and temperature, time and temperature guidelines. We're always keeping our food safe, number one. So keep these spreads and garnishes simple and neat. It's more about seeing them all lined up than it, uh, than it is to have anything too intricate. Got to have great flavor combinations, things that work well together as opposed to uh, as, as opposed to um, knocking against each other and really not being suitable to be paired with one another. Uh, so you always want to make sure that you have spicy or flavorful ingredients, things that are nice and full in flavor, because this will be the only thing that people will be eating at this particular time. Offer a nice variety. Having vegetarian and low-fat options are always a good idea as well, just so that all of the guests are well taken care of. And arrange them carefully and attractively. As you can see, these plates are not piled up by any means. And that's done by design. You want to have all of these uh, canapes so that they're nicely laid out, so they're uh, nicely spaced. Keeping your bread fresh is of paramount importance. So you, you want to have your bread delivered daily, preferably, if you're not making it daily. You want to use some moisture-proof wrapping around it. That's going to keep it as fresh for as long as possible. We're not storing this in the refrigerator. Um, we're going to keep it between 75 and 85 Fahrenheit. So a warm room is a good space. Is a good space to have it. It is going to start developing mold um, under those conditions in a fairly short period of time. That's why we always want to use fresh. So things like uh, French bread or hard crust bread, uh, use those the day that they are baked or delivered. If it's going to be kept uh, one uh, one more day, uh, we can store it in the freezer and we can thaw it uh, inside the wrapping uh, to keep it as fresh as possible. But day-old bread can be used. It's great for using for toast. I feel hungry just talking about all the things that we just looked at. Um, all these uh, wonderful different ways that we can make sandwiches and pizza. Who really knew until we started delving into all of this that there's such a massive variety? But it's important that we understand all of them because in our industry, there's demand for all of these items. So make sure you're reading up on these. Keep up with all these items. Let me know if you have any questions at all. I look forward to seeing you in the kitchen soon. Cheers.